a su majestad el rey Otunfo Osei Tutu II, rey del pueblo Ashanti de Ghana, a pronunciar el discurso inaugural. Madam President of the General Assembly, Zoom. Excellencies, it gives me great pleasure to address this General Assembly High Level Forum on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration and, uh, and Program of Action on a Culture of Peace. Zoom. I bring you warm greetings and felicitations from the President, Asantiman, the government and people of Ghana. Zoom. At the outset, I would like to express my profound gratitude to you, Madam President, and through you to member states of this organization for the gracious invitation extended to me to deliver the keynote address on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Declaration and Program of Action on the Culture of Peace. So, it is a source of great joy to me personally that this 20th anniversary commemoration has happily coincided with the 20th anniversary celebration of my instrument as the 16th occupant of the Golden Stool of the Asante Kingdom, established in the 17th century under Opimso Kino Seiti to the first, <clears throat> my great grand uncle. It is not often that the voice of a traditional ruler from our part of the universe, the authentic voice of quintessential organic, organic African institution is heard in this hall, <clears throat> the world's most renowned debating and policy-making forum. Zoom. I am therefore delighted by the noble gesture that has afforded me the unique opportunity today to mount this podium and share my thoughts with this August Assembly on a culture of peace, mobilizing traditional leadership and communities for peace and security in so, my capacity as a Santihne and also as a citizen of Ghana, a country which has consistently reaffirmed its support for the United Nations and its charter since joining the ranks of member states in 1957. So, I commend the President of the General Assembly for convening this commemorative event 
with a focus on rebuilding effective partnerships to better respond to emerging trends that impact on the realization of a culture of peace. <clears throat> I cannot emphasize enough the continuing relevance of the United Nations as the bastion of multilateralism in driving the agenda for peace, peaceful coexistence, and culture of nonviolence. I wish to express in this regard our appreciation to the Secretary General and his team for providing support for member states, civil society organizations, and all stake stakeholders in these efforts. Zoom. The United Nations deserves our full support and commitment to enable it to tackle the pressing problems of today. Zoom. It is only some four months since we had the honor of welcoming Madam President to our humble palace in Kumasi during her official visit to, Kumasi, to Ghana. The visit afforded her the opportunity to see something of the interplay of traditional and contemporary forces in the process of peace building in our country and also afforded us the scope to share some thoughts on how the core mandate of the UN may be further advanced. Zoom. We are deeply honored to, to have the opportunity to take Ghana's contribution to a new level by opening the door to a new conversation which hopefully could impact the UN in the honor struggle to preserve the peace and security of mankind. Zoom. Madam President, Zoom. I am sure that few will contest the fact that mankind is facing the greatest paradox in human history. On one hand, the benefits of nature's bounty have never been more abundant and more readily accessible. Zoom. Science and technology have expanded the frontiers of human creativity to a point where we can observe what happens in, on the moon in real time. And a teenager will, with a little tablet can create a software in his bedroom which turns him into a millionaire overnight. Zoom. The internet has stand on the light of knowledge beyond our wildest dreams. And yet, all that knowledge and wealth notwithstanding, we are faced with a stark reality that our world today is less safe, less secure, and less peaceful than it has ever been in history. Zoom. Where still, we have to contend with a real existential threat from a looming environmental catastrophe. Zoom. However this paradox plays out, the United Nations will continue to be the only credible source from which the world may garner hope for, for survival. But it must also be obvious that in the grave new circumstances of today, a new construct is needed for which the UN's family must be prepared afresh. Zoom. The global architecture created in San Francisco and Bretton Woods had real merits at the time. And truth be told, it has been decidedly successful in helping to keep mankind relatively at peace. It was right that the UN be becomes a collegiate of sovereign governments because it was only sovereign governments working together that could tackle the challenges of peace and security. The UN helped prevent the world from tipping over the precipice at the height of the Cold War. It saved us from the threat of nuclear Armageddon and helped bring a halt to a crippling arms race. All this was possible because all concerned knew who and what they were dealing with, the sovereign governments of states. Zoom. For a start, the peace dividend which the world, particularly the developing world, expected from the end of the Cold War turned out to be the ultimate phantom div dividend a marriage that has left us in a state in which we appear to have leapt from the frying pan of state-to-state -state conflicts into the uncontrollable blaze of unidentifiable actors, Zoom. making your seemingly innocent neighbor a potential weapon of mass destruction. Warfare is no longer the threat we face from states. It is now a danger we face on a daily basis from our citizens and from all quarters. Zoom. This new threat comes on the heels of an unprecedented trust deficit in political leadership at the natural, national level. The effect of this trust deficit is to erode the capacity of political leaders to rally their people to coalesce around national interests. The consequence for peace and security cannot be overstated. 
Jump. Madam President, Jump. in this climate, I suggest that the UN family cannot afford to remain glued to the established order without seeking pathways of reaching out to establish appropriate links capable of exerting the right influence in the quest for peace and security. Jump. I speak here particularly of Africa. Jump. You will per permit me, Madam President and distinguished delegates, to express the profound grief, I, uh, grief as I, I feel as the bearer and symbol of the heritage of a proud African kingdom about the image acquired by Africa within the councils of the United Nations and within the international community at large. It was in Africa over the Congo crisis that former Secretary General Doug Hammerstold was tragically killed in 1961 and the country remains in crisis to this day. From Congo to Somalia, from Sub Sudan to Mali, Sierra Leone to Chad, the United Nations has been obliged to pour resources to fend off unimaginable threats to the peace of the continent. From farming to deadly diseases, there's no challenge Africa has not thrown at the UN. Jump. Again, the UN held a special session of the General Assembly to proclaim a decade of African development. And yet, for all your efforts and the efforts of your agencies, we are still struggling to exist. I feel wounded and affronted by the perception that somehow Africa does not have what it takes to run its affairs. Jump. Africa indeed has what it takes and more. The problem is the historic fault line from the decolonization settlements of the 50s and 60s. Jump. As you know, before the colonial incursion into Africa, the Africans had strong traditional systems of governance. Some, like the Asante, as sophisticated as they appears in Europe. In the main, the colonial authorities co-opted the traditional system into the administration, allowing them to continue as a channel for the maintenance of law and order. Jump. It did not, of course, prevent a number of them from standing up for freedom. Unfortunately, however, the rising leaders of the freedom movement failed to appreciate the strategic role of the chiefs and rather unwisely lumped them together as appendages of the colonialists. Jump. The mistrust created between the nascent political leaders and the chiefs was to create the fault lines from which the continent is still suffering. The constitutional settlements of the liberation was characterized by the entrenchment of all the panoply of Westminster democracy to the almost total exclusion of the total uh, traditional governance that has served the people for centuries. Jump. The unraveling of the immediate post-colonial governments showed the extent to which the settlements had failed to glue the people together. Jump. The tra tragedy for me, however, is that the search for solutions has taken us everywhere except to the real fault line. For example, it remains the conventional wisdom that tribal or, eth or ethnic allegiance is responsible for Africa's predicament. This implies that we are so parochial in outlook, we have an inherent incapacity to coalesce around the broader interests of the nation state. Nothing represents a misdiagnosis of the African condition than this. Of course, ethnic loyalty is real in Africa. It is as real in Africa as it is in Europe, as real between the Scots and the English, as it is, as it is between the Irish and the Welsh, and as real in the Balkans as it is among the Catalans. It represents the fullness of our pride in our heritage in the same way as it does for any ethnic group in Europe or anywhere else. But we also have a deep sense of nationhood as many others. Jump. The danger arises when the true traditional institutions are violated and the leaders clothed with a traditional capacity for brotherly interaction and, prom and promote peaceful coexistence are discarded. That is when persons with questionable agendas step into the vacuum to wreak havoc. Jump. I hope enough has been said to stir the rethinking of the approach to the quest 
for peace and security in Africa and indeed for its development and its role in the global environmental challenge. Jump. Let me be clear, it is not a call for the reversal of the democratic processes in being on the continent. It is a case for the greater acknowledgement of traditional governance, the role it can play in peace building, economic development, and cr crucially, in the challenge of environmental change. Jump. It is a case for a new partnership between traditional governance and elected state authorities, not in the spirit of rivalry, but in the spirit of authentic collaboration. Jump. I am proud that in a quiet and informal way, we in Ghana are showing the benefits of the traditional and contemporary cohesion in governance. Apart from the constitutional arrangements for a national house of chiefs, the respect for traditional authority has created a layer of moral authority. We can be mobilized to intervene in times of crisis. On occasions where, where the political temperature has been on the verge of boiling over, it has been possible to bring the combatants into a quiet conclave to cool down passions and restore calm. Jump. At the conclusion of the, the last presidential and par parliamentary elections, the country stood on the edge of disaster. The UN representatives and the diplomatic community were aghast, alarmed that Ghana was about to slip down the slope of electoral violence. Fortunately, the moral authority of the palace was at hand. We were able to intervene to persuade the, lo the losing candidate to accept his fate and to fly both candidates for a quiet encounter to pave the way for a smooth handover. So, These are the highest examples of the crucial roles behind the curtains when the moral force of traditional authority is harnessed to protect and sustain the peace, unity, and security of Ghana. So, but there is a lot more that should be of interest to anyone consumed by the raging fire of conflicts in communities around the world. Traditional leadership, like any other leadership, involves developing a vision and marshalling the requisite resources, including the people behind its implementation. An important ingredient of true and effective leadership is governing from all, for all rather than a few, delivering the outcomes, including being prepared to be accountable to the people for the delivery or non-delivery of those outcomes. Jump. I am an ardent advocate of leadership by example, since my ascension to the Golden Institute some 20 years ago, it has long dawned on me that it would be unrealistic to expect government alone, with its limited resources and term, term limits, to be able to confront these multifaceted developmental challenges. With the passage of time, I have become more convinced that traditional authorities need to work together and in partnership with government, civil society organizations, faith-based groups, the private sector, our development partners, and other stakeholders if we are to succeed in tackling our developmental challenges. Jump. Consequently, I have taken a number of initiatives of my own in several areas. Education. The greatest potential of every nation lies in its human resources. The key to exploiting its resources is education. I set up the Otum for Education Fund to generate resources to provide opportunities for quality primary school, primary, secondary, tertiary, and vocational education, not only in my domain, but Ghana generally. Jump. To date, over 600,000 people, students, at various levels of education have benefited from the fund. Additionally, I set up a teacher's award scheme to encourage teachers in rural communities and motivate them to focus on teaching our wards well. Jump. Health, water, and sanitation. Jump. I later set up the Sewan Pim AIDS Foundation for children under the leadership of my spouse, Lady Julia Osetutu, to help children who have become victims of the HIV AIDS pandemic. These two bodies have now been merged under the umbrella of a 2 4 to Charity Foundation. The Charity Foundation is actively involved in the provision of social amenities in the, in the priority areas of health, water, and sanitation. Jump. Later, I also secured a World Bank grant for a pilot project entitled Promoting Partnerships with Traditional Authorities Project, which was a pilot project to ascertain 
whether traditional leaders were up to the task of contributing significantly to socioeconomic development of their communities. Zoom. The project was implemented by the Asandimai Council and focused on four main areas, namely education, primary school level, health, preventive, preventive health care, cultural heritage preservation, and capacity building. Zoom. Under the project, new school buildings, including teachers' quarters, were put up with facilities for portable water and electricity. One of the core strategies accounted for Ghana's success also lies in building effective partnerships at the national and local levels to address crisis. Hence, the importance of Sustainable Development Goal 17. Ghana's National Peace Council, which is an independent statutory body for peace, seeks, seeks to prevent and respond to conflicts and build sustainable peace in the country. Zoom. Throughout multiple election cycles, the National Peace Council, acting in consent with the, with the regional peace councils, has facilitated political dialogue before, during, after elections to ensure peaceful voting process and to defuse political tensions. Zoom. They have also been particularly instrumental in the peaceful resolution of some of the country's conflict hotspots. In all these initiatives and peace building mechanisms, there has been strong collaboration between traditional leaders and state institutions in advancing understanding, tolerance, and solidarity. Zoom. Ghana's traditional and relig religious institutions also represented on the National Peace Council have served as agents for justice, sustaining peace, and building inclusive communities. Indeed, in 2012, I got all the political parties to sign a declaration in Kumasi to respect and abide by the outcome of the elections. Ghana's peace-building infrastructure has proven successful, not only in dealing with protracted conflicts, but also in addressing difficult challenges preemptively, foster political inclusion, and avoid social tensions and conflict. Zoom. During the past two decades of my reign, I have used my good offices by quietly but actively engaging the major political leaders to ensure a seamless and peaceful transition from one political regime to another based on the outcome of our national elections. Zoom. This has invariably entailed holding tripartite meetings with the outgoing and incoming presidents of Ghana. This is very important because as part of the growing democratic dispensation in Africa, elections have now been accepted as the only legitimate means of changing governments. Zoom. Madam President, Zoom. as traditional rulers, we have been consistently engaged in conf conflict prevention, management, and resolution all the time. Peace has always been a core value in African traditional societies. At the instance of the President of the Republic in 2002, I was tasked together with two eminent chiefs to lead peace talks in search for a peaceful solution to a complicated communal conflict in Dabon in the northern part of Ghana which was posing a serious threat to peace and security in the area. Peace has been restored in the area in the new year now, the Dabon overlord has been enskinned after 17 years of protracted conflict. Jump. This was a crisis with all the potential to escalate and spin out of control. It was every inch as complex as any of the issues that have given Africa such a bad name. Jump. Traditional leaders, applying time on a traditional processes demonstrated their capacity to win the peace. Zoom. The resolution of the Dabon crisis through alternative dispute resolution has reinforced my belief in our, old, in our old fashioned and time tested way of resolving disputes through dialogue. It has always been a core belief in African culture that parties to a conflict need to be reconciled in order to build and maintain social trust and social cohesion, and thereby avoid a vendetta or retribution from developing and escalating between individuals or families or in a society as a whole. Jump. In conclusion, I wish to mind us, remind us all that sustaining the culture of peace requires, among others, nonviolence and respect for human rights, respect and solidarity among all peoples and dialogue between cultures, the linkage of peace to democratic participation and sustainable human development, the free flow and sharing of information and knowledge, contribution to conflict prevention and post-conflict peace building, 
and equally equality between women and men, all best supported through projects in which people take an active role in transforming their values, attitudes, and behaviors. Zoom. We have survived two global wars as well as the Cold War, but we are nowhere near achieving success in the most important contemporary war, the War for Sustainable Development. Zoom. No nation can afford to live in isolation. No nation, however powerful, can survive on its own in this globalized world. God, in his infinite wisdom, wants us and has indeed compelled us to live together on this planet called Earth and be each other's keeper. Without multilateral cooperation of the type represented and espoused by the UN, we cannot overcome the multifaceted monumental challenges conforming confronting us in, in our ambitions and arduous task of achieving the transformative 2030 agenda. Zoom. We cannot afford to continue to work in silos. We need to work in partnership and in tandem with each other to be successful. We have the means, the technology, the knowledge, and the resources to deal with current and emerging challenges. Let us use the occasion of this anniversary to rekindle the fire in our belly re-energize ourselves and renew our collective commitment to make the world a better place for all. Jump. History will never forgive nor absolve us if we fail to stand by the courage of our convictions and live up to, the, to our responsibilities by promoting the culture of peace as a sustainable basis and thereby ensure accelerated implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Jump. I urge all member states to pursue partnerships at the national level and seek appropriate pathways in promoting and sustaining global culture of peace. Zoom. I am sure you are aware of the wealth of knowledge and expertise among traditional rulers in Africa. It is unpardonable that such results be wasted because we cannot evolve how to get the best out of our birthright. Zoom. I thank you for your attention and I wish you successful deliberations. Zoom. I thank His Royal Majesty Otumfu Osei Tutu II, King of the Ashanti people, for his profound and comprehensive keynote speech. <laughs>